Apostles can be called many things. Hideous, monstrous, unnatural, taboo, gluttonous, homicidal for no reason, the god hands lapdogs, you get the drill. Rarely can an apostle be called truly majestic, and yet that's exactly what you'll think when you see Sir Locus in his released form. Even outside of it, he's the definition of a knightly figure, a living legend come back from the grave to serve the Falcon of Light. The Moonlight Knight is one of, if not the most loyal commander that Griffith has, and his apostle powers are neat as well. But what are those powers, you might be asking if you're unfamiliar with Locus? Well, that's why this video exists, so sit back, relax, and learn everything there is to know about the anatomy of Locus, the Moonlight Knight. Who is Locus? How did he become an apostle? It's quite rare to get a backstory for an apostle in Berserk, mostly because there isn't enough time to invest that much in what are essentially tertiary characters. But the ones with narrative importance have been fleshed out a little bit more than, say, Wild, and lucky for us, Locus is one such apostle. Unlike many of his brethren, though, he had a great reputation in his human life, which he maintained well after his death because Locus was one of the greatest lancers the West had ever seen. In chapter 194, we get a brief description of what is known of him before he became a reborn falcon, and to say that it's impressive would be an understatement. Locus is basically the Loras Tyrell of Berserk when it comes to riding. He was one of the mightiest knights in all Holy See territories, and he went his entire life without suffering a single loss, be it tourney or duel. His personal sigil was two crescent moons facing each other, and despite having such a stellar record, Locus never quite committed to one master. He remained on an internal peregrination and became a living legend amongst warriors, who told bedtime stories about him to their sons. One of those sons was the man giving us all of this information, Mule Wolfflame, who was as excited at Locus's appearance as he was confused. Why would a man that had never pledged his sword to anyone while he was at the peak of his knightly life now devote it to an upstart liberator? And besides, what was Locus even doing here? As causality would have it, the answer to Mule's question is in the question itself. Locus spent his entire life looking for the ideal master to serve, but it seems like he could never find one that met his standards. Mule called him a living legend, so we have to assume that he must have been active at least shortly before the Band of the Falcon became a thing. Considering he never lost a single battle, duel, or joust, it's hard to imagine that Locus died due to reasons of warfare. Old age can be ruled out as well, considering he'd still be alive even if his prime ended before Griffiths began. So how did he become an apostle? Well, our best guess is he tried to commit good old-fashioned seppuku and was interrupted with the promise of his heart's desire. Locus trying to kill himself because he found no one worthy of his service, only for the god hand to step in and dissuade him, fits the pattern that the demonic quintumvirate usually displays. A similar thing happened with Grunbeld, who was promised an endless war so long as he exchanged the lives of his loved ones in order to become a fire-breathing dragon. Because Grunbeld and Locus have pretty similar backstories, we imagine their reasons for ascension were similar as well. And with Locus, we also get proof of this. But we'll address that later on in the video, so make sure you stick around until the very end. Now that we have the why out of the way, the how becomes simple. He used a behelet he found at some point in his life. He sacrificed someone that defined his humanity to become an inhuman, and once that happened, he set out to look for the promised leader, aka the Falcon of Light. Locus first appears in chapter 183, and his first words state that he is ridden to Shet, guided by an oracle, searching for the Falcon of Light. For those of you who know Grunbeld's story, you know the exact same thing happened with him upon his reincarnation, and if you don't know anything about it, we suggest you check out our video on Berserk, the Flame Dragon Knight, the only spin-off story from the entire Berserk franchise. Once Griffith recognized Locus and accepted his sword into his service, the Moonlight Knight set about displaying why he should become the Falcon's most trusted general. He was the second apostle to pledge himself to Griffith after Zod, and his achievements on the battlefield soon saw him appointed as one of Griffith's war demon captains. Currently, he leads the reborn Band of the Falcon's Lancer unit. And that's the perfect segue into the next section because we want to talk about how does Locus's apostle form reflect his previous life? Even without getting into his apostle form, Locus is a physical specimen. The Moonlight Knight retains his lunar motif following his reincarnation, but he becomes more pointed, more aggressive, 
similar to how Griffith's falcon symbol changes after his return. In the one image we see of Locust before he became an apostle, he's wearing standard knight livery, full-plated armor, a visor with a plume on it, a pretty standard-looking armored horse, and the lance that created his legend. After his reincarnation, the plume turns into crescent details that surround Locust's helm like a moon. His horse's armor looks far more intricate, and he's using an ultra-large jousting lance in battle, which is counterintuitive, but somehow Locust makes it work. The Moonlight Knight's strength in his base form is pretty formidable. Standing well over seven feet tall, he towers over most humans and cuts a figure worthy of his legend. He has such strength that he can skewer six people with his lance without resistance, and he rides like such a natural that his horse might as well be part of his body. Yet, it's his apostle form that makes that association literal, because when he assumes it, Locust becomes a demonic centaur. Locust doesn't need to engage his apostle form to take care of most of his enemies, but when he comes up against monstrous beings like Ganeshka's Daka, Pishacha, or his pseudo-apostles, he needs that extra oomph that his human form lacks. As a person, Locus only rides like half a horse, but as an apostle, he becomes one. This was to be expected considering most apostles are granted forms that best reflect their ideal image of themselves. When Locus triggered his reincarnation ceremony, his intense desire to serve under a worthy master as his greatest champion ended up informing the form he took as an apostle. And of course, the fact that he was the best jouster in the world also played a major role in shaping that form. When Locus transforms, he becomes what can only be described as an armored centaur. His head takes on the shape that his visor had, his pauldrons become his shoulders, and the bottom half of his body turns into that of a horse. With the need to command another beast being subsumed by his own anatomy, it cuts Locus's work in half and increases his efficiency twofold. He no longer needs to rely on his horse's physical capabilities to navigate a battle because he is the horse. Locus's intuition for warfare will allow him to tear through any battlefield just as easily as Zod in his release state. But, unlike the Immortal One, Locust doesn't have to worry about reattaching severed limbs, given that taking them off his body is next to impossible. Is Locust's skin metallic? How his natural body armor works? When we said that Locus's head takes on the shape of his visor and his pauldrons become his shoulders, we weren't just trying to paint a picture for you, we were being literal. That's because we weren't trying to beat around the bush when we called him an armored centaur, that's literally what he is. Now, any of you that are familiar with Greek or Roman mythology, or Percy Jackson for that matter, will know that armoring a centaur isn't exactly possible. You could protect the upper body with conventional armor and the lower with horse armor, but the latter doesn't cover everything. And besides, horse armor is heavy, and a centaur's greatest battle advantage is supposed to be its movement speed. If Locus's apostle form saw him become a regular centaur, it would have been fairly pointless because he'd still be open to attacks from all directions. And if Dragon Slayer found its way to his flesh, he'd be butchered like so many of his previous mounts. If Locus wanted to live through the Golden Age for which he sacrificed his humanity, he needed to ensure that he stayed alive long enough to do it. So, his solution was to turn his very flesh into armor. The reason Locus's body looks like it can shine in the moonlight is because it does. The moonlight bounces right off that metallic surface. When he takes on his released form, Locus quasi-merges with his armor and becomes a metallic centaur that is a hundred times deadlier than its mythological counterpart. His head looks like a cross between his visor and Cyclops' glasses, because his eyes are just a line of glowing red magma housed within a crescent moon-shaped arc of death. Every last inch of his body looks like it's covered in metal, and the overall silhouette of it makes the body itself a weapon. Locus has a massive hooked protrusion coming out of his front end, which isn't for hanging his cloak if you haven't guessed already. If anyone were stupid enough to try to stop his charge with their bodies, they'd be sliced through like a pig in a slaughterhouse. Trying to mount him and steer him like a horse wouldn't work either, because on his back, Locus has crescent-shaped protrusions that make sitting on him impossible. Saddles would be useless because they'd just be ripped to shreds by his mane. The ends of his joints are pointed like a lance, and his metallic physiology makes him only one of two known apostles with such unnaturally durable skin. The other one, if you're wondering, is Grunveld, because of course it is. The Flame Dragon Knight's apostle skin is made out of corundum, the third hardest naturally occurring ore in the world. The only thing that managed to crack his skin was a full power thrust swing from Berserker Guts, and that's a pretty rare thing as it is. Locus, to his credit, has never had a crack in his armor, and that's sort of the point. His apostle body exists to make his lancing a natural part of his body movement. By eliminating the need to worry about injuries, Locus can focus solely on skewering his enemies to death in the name of his leader. We've seen him take his released form at least a half dozen times in the series, and so far, he hasn't taken damage even once. In fact, we haven't even seen anyone land a proper hit on him, and that has a lot to do with the other thing his Apostle transformation affects, his lance. 
Is Locus's lance a part of his body? Its maximum range will shock you. The Moonlight Knight built his legend on the back of his skill as a jouster, so it shouldn't shock you that he has the best lance in the game. What might shock you though, is the fact that his weapon increases in size with his transformation. That's right, it appears as though Locus's lance is connected to his body. Even in his human form, Locus's weapon is pretty damn impressive. Remember how we told you he skewered six people's heads with it in a single go? Well, he could only do so because his lance is unique. Lances weren't used as frequently as you'd expect in medieval warfare. In fact, they were mostly used by cavalrymen during their initial charge. Subsequent attacks would almost always come down to a melee, where swords were of more use than a weapon whose length was specifically meant for skewering targets at long distances. Lances are typically 2-3 to three meters long, and there's a massive difference between battle lances and the one Locus uses. Battle lances are extremely long spears. They have massive slender poles with a small blade attached to their tips for aerodynamics. War spears see more than a single use in the field, so if they were as heavy as tourney lances, they would just weigh the rider down and make them a liability. That brings us to the weapon Locus uses, which is a tourney lance. A tourney lance has many notable differences in comparison to a battle lance. Its body is bulkier and shaped like a tapering cone as opposed to a spear. It's tailor-made for thrusting opponents off their horses, if not outright killing them. On the field, you might face men with varying amounts of armor on their bodies, but in a tourney, you're most likely going up against knights in full plate armor. The shape of the tourney lance is specifically made to tip off such an opponent, which is also why many tourney lances shatter upon impact. Lances are typically made of wood, and depending on the thickness of an enemy's armor and the way it hits them, they can splinter and break quite easily. But Locus's lance is special because it seems to be made out of solid steel. Not only is his tourney lance a lot slimmer than the ones you'd see in an actual tournament, it's all metal, which allows multiple uses without any concern of his weapon splintering or breaking. Locus's lance appears to have been maximized in length, so we feel comfortable saying it must be at least two and a half, if not three meters long. That's an insane range already, and no wonder he was able to put it through six heads at once. But what makes Locus's lance even better is the fact that it changes its size when he transforms. Post-transformation, Locus's lance gains another side, doubling its length and allowing him to kill at least twice as many people as before. Both lengths of his lance also gain bladed edges, which allows him to not only thrust it through multiple targets, but also slice through dozens of them in a singular circular motion. We see this exact thing happen in Chapter 234, when Locus and his war demon lancers go up against Ganeshka's Daka and Pishacha. The fact that the lance takes on this appearance when Locus transforms can mean only one thing. Locus and his lance are connected. When he's in his base form, the lance too is in its base form, but when he transforms, it too is released. It's similar to Irvine's bow, which becomes a part of his body once he transforms, but you'll learn more about that soon enough. At its maximum length, we've seen Locus put 10 bodies on his lance effortlessly. If his blade truly doubles in size, and it was at minimum 2.5 meters long, he gains an additional 2.5 meters plus to bring the total size of his weapon to a staggering 5 meters at minimum. Now, there's an offset, of course, because Locus still has to account for his upper body when unleashing his Arc of Death, or even just handling his lance but the fact remains that he is one of the most lethal apostles by far, and when Emperor Ganeshka compliments your form, you know you're really good at what you do. But having said that, it brings us to our final question of the video. Is Locus stronger than Griffith's strongest apostle? Is Locus stronger than Nosferatu Zod? What makes him Griffith's most important apostle? One of the biggest debates in the Berserk community is who Griffith's strongest war demon is, now that he's acquired so many of them. Most people think it's Zod, and for obvious reasons. Others think it's Grunbeld, which, from an endurance and destruction perspective, is probably true. No one brings up poor Irvine because archers always get a bad rap, but the sleeper choice is Locus, and there is some merit to his supporters' claims. Locus is the only apostle we see in the entire series that goes through life without taking a single punch, kick, bite, or any other kind of damage. The dude just shows up, wrecks house, and leaves. We've already mentioned his previous feat of just slicing through most of Ganeshka's Daka and Pishacha, but during the final battle between Griffith and Ganeshka, Locus is one of the former's best performing soldiers. He goes through that entire battle with Ganeshka's pseudo-apostle spawns without taking a single hit on panel, whilst dispatching several of them to the Shadow Realm. Zod has taken damage many times before, and considering everything we just said about Locus's body being metal and all, it should be pretty tough for the Immortal One to tear through 
his skin, right? Well, Zod is called the Immortal One for a reason, and besides, he isn't the one Locust needs to worry about. Grunbeld could straight up melt his body with his flames if he wanted to, so the point of strength is extremely relative when it comes to the war demons. Is Locust stronger than Zod? As a Lancer, undoubtedly, but as an Apostle, it's debatable. We haven't seen enough action from him to judge that, and we've seen plenty from Zod to feel confident that he can whip just about any Apostle's ass any time of the day. He's Griffith's right-hand man for a reason, you guys, and it's not just because he's more comfortable to sit on. Either way, Locust is something far more important for Griffith, and that's a bridge between his demons and the humans he aspires to rule over someday. Locust was a knight in his human life. He's keenly aware of many political affairs, including the sheer futility of them. He never committed to a single lord or master during his entire life because he always sought the ideal one, and one way or another, those people would always let him down. But when he was reborn, the oracle told him he would find his heart's desire in the Falcon of Light, and to Locus, that prophecy has come true. As an apostle with the understanding of how human politics and his own people work, Locus can grasp the full scope of Griffith's ambition, and he's dazzled by it. To him, the Falcon is the embodiment of the divine right of kings, and yes, it is because he's a God Hand member. Locus is proud of the fact that Griffith has helped apostles like him find a place in this world, and he serves as the Falcon's number one political and military advisor, because he wants to keep things living in this utopia. Locus has advised Griffith on many matters, like the policy of taking war pledges, which is similar to the Kushan practice of taking war slaves. He explains the practicality of this system to Mule when the latter flares up at the idea of fighting alongside his enemy, and uses his wealth of knowledge about how the world works to justify Griffith's choices. When the nobility tries to screw Griffith out of taking command of all Holy Sea forces, Locus is the one who pipes up and shames them for their cowardice, reminding them the principle of a general army. In Chapter 358, we learn why Locus wasn't with Griffith during the offensive against the Giants. He was preparing military reports. The Moonlight Knight is Griffith's chief liaison with the political council of Falconia, and his main man when it comes to keeping the war demons in check. Locus is arguably far more important to Griffith than Grunbeld, Zod, and Irvine all combined, because he's the only one who has the knowledge required to keep his whole demon posing as Jesus charade up and running. Without Locus, Griffith would have a tough time keeping his hold over the developments within the human realm, because it's thanks to his heavy-handedness that he was able to turn things around in that chapter we just mentioned. When the council meeting began, everyone was opposed to spending money on the construction of a single orphanage. By its end, everyone had agreed to basically revolutionize the way their culture and society function, all because Griffith and Locus expertly played them into their own hands. The pair tag-teamed them with military facts that politicians had no interest in or control over, but in a world overrun with magical beasts, the military was now the main power in Falconia. Griffith sitting at Princess Charlotte's right hand as her betrothed and the supreme commander of her regular army aren't possible without Locus sitting on his left and that's what makes him the most important war demon that the Falcon has. Locus is the definition of a true believer, and he'll do anything to prove his faith in Griffith's vision for the world. That statement should probably scare you, but what's even scarier is the fact that this man also possesses the lethality to assist in bringing that vision to life, and he's yet to take an L to anyone, not even the Dread Emperor. Marvelous Verdict! But as for this video, we're afraid this is where we're gonna have to leave you because that's all we've got on Locus's anatomy. Who do you think wins between the Immortal One and the Moonlight Knight? When will we get to see him have a proper slugfest in the series? And will he eventually take that L when he finally faces off against Guts? Let us know what you think in the comments section down below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more berserk content. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, keep on struggling, strugglers.